from the chance of being eaten by coconut crabs to the possibility of being captured by the Japanese, and now with a new sonar image suggesting her disappearance at sea, this is the intriguing story of Amelia Earhart. Amelia Mary Earhart was born in Atchison, Kansas, on July 24, 1897. Her father Edwin Earhart worked as a railroad lawyer, and her mother Amelia Amy Otis came from a wealthy family. But when her grandparents died, money became tight because her father struggled with alcoholism. They moved around a lot, and she finished high school in Chicago in 1916. When her mom got some money from her inheritance, Amelia went to a school in Pennsylvania. But things changed when she visited her sister in Canada during World War I. She got interested in helping wounded soldiers, so she left college and worked as a Red Cross nurse's aide in Toronto, Canada in 1918. After the war, she came back to the United States and joined Columbia University in New York to study pre-med. Her first airplane ride was in California in December 1920 with Frank Hawks, a famous World War I pilot, and she fell in love with flying. In January 1921, she began flying lessons with Nita Snook, a female flight instructor. To pay for these lessons, she worked as a filing clerk at the Los Angeles Telephone Company. In the same year, she bought her first plane, a used Kinner Airster, and called it the Canary. She passed her flight test in December 1921, getting a National Aeronautics Association license. On October 22, 1922, she flew her plane to a record altitude of 14,000 feet, which was the highest ever for a female pilot at the time. In 1932, she became the first woman and the second person after Charles Lindbergh to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. She started from Newfoundland, Canada, on May 20th in a red Lockheed Vega 5B and reached Londonderry, Northern Ireland, the next day, landing in a cow field. When she returned to the United States, Congress honored her with the Distinguished Flying Cross. In 1935, she made history again by flying solo from Hawaii to California, a dangerous journey covering 2,408 miles or 3,875 kilometers, even longer than the distance from the United States to Europe. She departed from Honolulu on January 11th, after 17 hours and 7 minutes, landed in Oakland the next day. Later that year, she also became the first person to fly solo from Los Angeles to Mexico City. Amelia Earhart's endeavor to become the first person to circumnavigate the Earth along the equator ended tragically with her disappearance on July 2, 1937. To undertake this historic journey, Earhart acquired a Lockheed Electra L-10E aircraft and enlisted Fred Noonan, an experienced navigator, as her second navigator. Their ambitious plan involved departing from Oakland, California, and flying westward to Hawaii. From there, they would continue across the vast Pacific Ocean to reach Australia. Subsequently, they intended to cross the subcontinent of India, proceed to Africa, then Florida, and finally return to California. On March 17, 1937, they commenced their journey from Oakland. However, they encountered various issues while flying across the Pacific and were compelled to make a stop in Hawaii for repairs at the United States Navy's field on Ford Island and Pearl Harbor. Despite facing periodic challenges, they resumed their journey after three days. However, during takeoff, Earhart lost control of the Electra, resulting in substantial damage that necessitated extensive repairs in California. By the time the plane was repaired, weather patterns and global wind changes required alterations to the flight plan. This time Earhart and her crew would fly east. Following their flight from Oakland to Miami, Earhart and Noonan departed from Miami on June 1, 1937, amid considerable public attention. Their flight took them towards Central and South America before they turned eastward towards Africa. Crossing the Indian Ocean, they finally landed in La, New Guinea, on June 29, 1937, having completed approximately 22,000 miles of their journey. Nonetheless, they still had to cover the remaining 7,000 miles over the Pacific Ocean. While in La, Earhart fell ill with dysentery, requiring several days to recover. During this period, various adjustments were made to the plane, including the addition of extra fuel. Additionally, they packed away the parachutes, deeming them unnecessary for flying over the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. Their next destination was Howland Island, situated 2,556 miles away between Hawaii and Australia. Howland Island posed a unique challenge due to its small size and flat terrain, making it difficult to distinguish from similar cloud formations. 
To address this challenge, Earhart and Noonan devised a detailed plan involving celestial navigation, radio communication with the U.S. Coast Guard vessel, Itasca, to station near Howland Island, and utilizing maps, compasses, and the position of the rising sun to determine their location relative to the island. Departing from Laos on July 2, 1937, at 12.30 a.m., they headed eastward towards Howland Island. However, several early decisions led to significant consequences later on. They left behind radio equipment with shorter wavelength frequencies to accommodate fuel canisters, which could have extended the range of radio signals. Moreover, carrying inadequate quantities of high-octane fuel meant the Electra was short of its full capacity by 50 gallons, potentially affecting their range. Their journey encountered difficulties from the outset. Witnesses reported a damaged radio antenna during takeoff, and Noonan faced challenges with celestial navigation due to extensive overcast conditions. Subsequently, it was discovered that they were using inaccurate maps, placing Howland Island nearly six miles off its actual position. These circumstances led to a series of problems that proved insurmountable. As Earhart and Noonan reached the supposed position of Howland Island, they maneuvered into their north and south tracking route to locate the island. They searched for visual and auditory signals from the Itasca, but radio communication was very poor that day for various reasons. There was also confusion between Earhart and the Itasca over which frequencies to use, and a misunderstanding about the agreed-upon check-in time. The flyers were operating on Greenwich Civil Time, and the Itasca was operating on the Naval Time Zone, which set their schedules 30 minutes apart. On the morning of July 2, 1937, at 7.20 a.m., Earhart reported her position, placing the Electra on a course 20 miles southwest of the Nukumano Islands. At 7.42 a.m., the Itasca picked up this message from Earhart. We must be on you, but we cannot see you. Fuel is running low. Been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at 1,000 feet. The ship replied, but there was no indication that Earhart heard this. The flyer's last communication was at 8.43 a.m. Although the transmission was marked as questionable, it is believed Earhart and Noonan thought they were running along the north-south line. However, Noonan's chart of Howland's position was off by five nautical miles. The Itasca released its oil burners in an attempt to signal the flyers, but they apparently didn't see it. In all likelihood, their tanks ran out of fuel, and they had to ditch at sea. When the Itasca realized that they had lost contact, they began an immediate search. Despite the efforts of 66 aircraft and 9 ships, an estimated $4 million rescue authorized by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, the fate of the two flyers remained a mystery. The official search ended on July 18, 1937. They were declared lost at sea, but Putnam, Earhart's husband, financed additional search efforts, working off tips from naval experts and even psychics in an attempt to find his wife. In October 1937, he acknowledged that any chance of Earhart and Noonan surviving was gone. On January 5, 1939, Earhart was declared legally dead by the Superior Court in Los Angeles. Since her disappearance, several theories have formed regarding Earhart's last days, many of which have been connected to various artifacts that have been found on Pacific Islands. One theory said that the plane that Earhart and Noonan were flying was ditched or crashed, and the two perished at sea. Several aviation and navigation experts support this theory, concluding that the outcome of the last leg of the flight came down to poor planning, worse execution. Investigations concluded that the Electra aircraft wasn't fully fueled and couldn't have made it to Howland Island even if conditions were ideal. The fact that there were so many issues creating difficulties lead investigators to the conclusion that the plane simply ran out of fuel some 35 to 100 miles off the coast of Howland Island. The aircraft itself was never found, though in late 2023, an ocean exploration company in South Carolina, Deep Sea Vision, captured a sonar image in the Pacific Ocean that appears to be Earhart's Lockheed 10E Electra aircraft. However, the aircraft-like object doesn't possess certain characteristics of Earhart's Lockheed Electra, like the twin engines. To confirm if this newly found anomaly is indeed Earhart's plane, it would necessitate revisiting the site for a more thorough investigation of the aircraft. Additionally, a definitive confirmation would involve locating the certification which was printed on the underside of the missing Lockheed's wing. Another theory said that Earhart and Noonan may have flown without radio communication after their last signal, landing on the uninhabited Nicomararo Reef. 
a small island in the Pacific Ocean located 350 miles southeast of Howland Island. It is theorized that this is where they ultimately met their demise. Researchers studying tide patterns have speculated that Earhart and Noonan landed on Nikumararo Reef, the only area large enough to accommodate a plane in the vicinity, during low tides when they could safely run the engine without the risk of flooding. Additionally, various individuals reported receiving radio messages from Earhart, which were documented in publications from that time. For instance, on July 4th, two days after the supposed crash, a resident of San Francisco claimed to have heard a radio transmission stating, Still alive. Better hurry. Tell husband all right. Three days later, someone in eastern Canada reported hearing the message, Can you read me? Can you read me? This is Amelia Earhart. Please come in. Believed to be the final verifiable transmission from the pilot. This theory is supported by various on-site investigations that have uncovered items such as makeshift tools, fragments of clothing, an aluminum panel, and a piece of plexiglass with the exact dimensions and curvature of a window from Earhart's plane. Additionally, in May 2012, a jar of freckle cream believed to belong to Earhart was discovered on a remote island in the South Pacific, along with other related findings. Furthermore, in October 2014, Researchers from the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery reported finding a 19-inch by 23-inch piece of metal on Nicomararo's reef that was identified as part of Earhart's plane. This metal fragment had been found in 1991 on a small, uninhabited island in the southwestern Pacific. In July 2017, a team consisting of four forensic bone-sniffing dogs from Tyre and the National Geographic Society claimed to have located the area where Earhart may have died. Initially, in 1940, a British official reported discovering human bones beneath a wren tree on the island. Subsequent expeditions revealed potential evidence of an American female castaway, including remnants of a campfire and a woman's compact. The tire team reported that all four dogs detected human remains near the wren tree and sent soil samples to a laboratory in Germany for DNA analysis. In 2018, Anthropologist Richard Jantz announced the results of a study in which he re-examined the original forensic analysis of the bones discovered in 1940. The original analysis determined the bones to possibly be from a short, stocky European male, but Jantz noted that the scientific techniques used at the time were still being developed. After comparing the bone measurements with data from 2,776 individuals from that era, and considering photos of Earhart and her clothing measurements, Jantz concluded that there was a high likelihood of a match. Jantz stated, This analysis indicates that Earhart shares more similarities with the Nicomararo bones than 99% of individuals in a large reference sample, emphasizing the strong support for the conclusion that the Nicomararo bones belong to Amelia Earhart. The question of their whereabouts leads to a gruesome theory suggesting that their bodies were consumed by coconut crabs, also known as Burgus latro, which are large carnivorous hermit crabs. These creatures weigh up to 9 pounds or 4 kilograms, with a body length of 16 inches, equipped with formidable claws capable of cracking open coconuts. They inhabit various Pacific islands in the vicinity where Earhart and Noonan disappeared, including Nicomararo. Although not all skeletal remains necessary to form a complete skeleton were recovered, a study conducted in 2014 proposed that coconut crabs may have dragged some bones back to their burrows. While coconut crabs typically feed on birds, rodents, other crabs, and carrion, they are not considered aggressive hunters and do not have a preference for consuming humans. If these crabs were indeed involved in the scenario, it is plausible that they consumed the remains of Earhart and Noonan after their demise on the island. Another theory suggests that Earhart and Noonan were held captive by the Japanese. This theory proposes that Japanese pilots discovered Earhart and Noonan on an island further south before transporting them to Saipan, where they were allegedly executed. This theory is partially based on the recollections of Tanakin Tuho, who worked at the Saipan prison camp and recalled the arrival of two white Americans, a woman and a man, in the 1930s. The idea of a prison camp involving Earhart and Noonan dates back to the 1960s, when CBS radio reporter Fred Gorner interviewed witnesses claiming to have seen two white flyers or spies on the island before World War II. They claimed that one of them was a tall white woman was dressed like a man, with her hair cut short. Additionally, there is an old photograph purported to depict Earhart, Noonan, in their plane in Saipan. A facial recognition expert believes that the individuals in the photo resemble Earhart and Noonan, 
with the male figure having a hairline similar to Nunit's. Moreover, a ship in the photo is towing an object that matches the measurements of Earhart's plane. However, some experts have raised doubts about the authenticity of this theory, with one expert dismissing the photo as silly. Furthermore, in July 2017, a Japanese military blogger discovered the same photo in a Japanese-language travelogue archived in Japan's National Library, indicating that the picture was published in 1935, two years before Earhart's disappearance. The communications director of the National Archives informed NPR that the archives lack information regarding the date or photographer of the photograph. And there you have it, the compelling tale of Amelia Earhart, a woman whose adventurous spirit knew no bounds. Despite the passage of time, her disappearance remains one of the greatest aviation mysteries of all time. As we reflect on Earhart's legacy, speculation continues to swirl regarding the circumstances of her disappearance. Some theories suggest that her plane may have simply run out of fuel and crashed into the ocean, while others propose that she and her navigator, Fred Noonan, may have landed on a remote island, only to meet an uncertain fate. But what do you think happened to Amelia Earhart? Do you have your own theory about her disappearance? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And if there's a mistake or something we missed in our exploration, feel free to let us know in the comments as well. Your input helps us continue our journey of discovery together. We hope you enjoyed this deep dive into history. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more intriguing content. Until next time, keep exploring and never stop seeking answers to the mysteries that surround us. Thank you for watching.